Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday morning live stream. Hope you're all doing well. It's a hot and sticky morning here in Noosa. Feels like it's going to start storming up any minute, so should be interesting. Hope you're all doing well. Good morning, Rosalie in Dargo. Welcome. Morning, Audrey. And good morning, Peter in New Zealand. G'day, Margaret. G'day, Jenny in Williamstown. Morning, Sharon in Auckland. G'day, Gail in Georgia. And W Lynn572 in Ontario. Welcome. G'day, Colin in New South Wales. Morning, Sajada in Nevada. And good morning, Linda in British Columbia. Morning, Diane on the Gold Coast. And Carolina in New Nelson, New Zealand. G'day, Foxy in Geelong. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Morning, Beverly in Dryden, Ontario. Morning, Valerie. G'day, Lisa Ruthen. How are you? Morning, Sheena in Melbourne. G'day, Ann Dawes in Perth and Jenny on the Gold Coast. Audrey, we have cold, rainy weather in Tasmania with snow forecast. Goodness me. They reckon we're going to have three days worth of, sorry, three months worth of rain in three days, but um, believe it when I see it. Hey, Linda in Moncton. Welcome. All right. Marie in Forster. Forster Tun Curry, I imagine. Um, my granny and my auntie used to live in Forster. And, uh, or is that Forster in Victoria? Morning, Janet. And g'day Terry, g'day Sherry, g'day Marie in New Hampshire, Wanda in Honolulu, morning Margaret. Okay, now we're going to revisit a painting from the past. I'm pretty sure it was one of the Learn to Paint TV ones. It's a photo I took in Capity Valley. And um, I was just looking at my version of it the other day and I completely got it wrong. Um, and I'm okay to admit that, kind of. <laughs> um, but the problem was the orientation. I've been talking about this a lot lately. Notice it's quite a wide panoramic shot and I tried to paint it onto a 16 by 20. So it didn't quite work because I pushed everything up. Okay, so what I've got today is a 16 by 20 canvas and I've taped it across the top. We're gonna paint on the bottom and then I'll just add some more sky in to it. But I, I like it as a scene. Um, it's got a lot of depth path leads you in to getting the right balance between the shadows and the light so um, I thought we'd have a little play around with that we'll go back to basics this is our Wednesday live stream and um, you know it's all about focusing in on the basics and doing the basic simple things getting those right so um, there's a copy of the photo in the members area so you can log in there and grab that and we'll get underway G'day to everybody who I haven't had a chance to say g'day to yet. Thank you for joining us across all the different platforms. Um, all right, so we will get underway. We're going to go right back to basics, which means we're going to go back to using just three colors. Now, I don't have a printout of the photo, so that should make it interesting. I did a little sketch, so that should help. Um, all right, let's come down to the palette here, my messy palette. And we'll just consider what we need to consider on the palette. Um, I'm going to basically concentrate most of this on French Ultramarine Blue. So that's my blue, Lizard and Crimson and the Yellow Ochre. The three basic primaries that I use for landscape painting and Titanium White. And we might get into the uh, lighter yellow and maybe a bit of Thalo towards the end of this painting, but certainly not in the early stages. Okay, so that's our setup. I'm going to use mostly, you know, I say three brushes, so I count that as one brush, one big flat brush, right? Then I'm going to use a medium-sized flat brush and a small, and a palette knife, all right? So three brushes and a palette knife. Why do I have three of the big ones? Because I use one for my dark, one for my lights, and so on, just saves me washing them, but essentially three brushes. But we'll start off with a small one and we'll do a drawing. And I'm using water mixable oils, but this same approach we're going to use, the more method of painting, will work equally with um, acrylics, traditional oils, and gouache. Okay, a few subtle differences between the different mediums, but essentially the, the painting process will be the same, right? So I'll just mix up a little puddle of dark there. 
And I will pause for questions at each step. Um, so right now we're going to do step number one of the more method of painting, which is to really map in our big shapes. I don't know if you've had a chance yet to see the master's analysis that I released yesterday. Uh, the artist William Went, American Californian Impressionist. Um, but, you know, his paintings were all about big shapes. Um, and uh, getting the values and everything right. So I'm going to treat this as my canvas up to this tape here. Okay, and I'll come in and add a little bit to the uh, sky later on. So the first thing is to get that horizon line. It's a little bit deceptive. It's kind of just over the halfway mark and it's kind of running downhill, something like that. Okay. I'm not here to do a perfect drawing. I'm just here to place big shapes. And so that's always a good starting point, I think, is getting that horizon line in. And um, from there, from there, we'll go for our first big shape. Um, and our first big shape is going to be that big tree on the right hand side there. Okay. So there's no point in us mucking around with anything else. Get that big shape in. Now if you have a look at how far over does it come, how far into the painting does this big tree come? And it's a little bit deceptive, it doesn't really come that far in. It's probably 20%. It's very easy to make it bigger, isn't it? <laughs> So it's going, to, it's going to fit into a shape around about there. And I think maybe this line's a little bit too low. I think maybe it wants to be more like that. We'll see. Um, part of the reason why I do these drawings very loose is so that I'm not, I don't feel overcommitted to them. And that way I can adjust them as we go. Okay. So there's a sort of shadow through there and there. And we've got tree trunks and things in there, tree trunks in there. That kind of feels right, doesn't it? Maybe I'm even over a little bit too far. Mm. We'll see. We'll see how it progresses, right? So there's a, some mixed sort of shadow in there. Now, the path is, it doesn't quite, if I use this as my new line here, the path doesn't quite come all the way up to the top of that horizon stops just short so I'll use this line here for that and it's going to come down to about there and it's going to come down to about there so it comes down and then it comes across come down that way and then it's sort of sweeping out that way a little bit so maybe it's too wide, It'll come down there and across that way. So I've got this little bit of the shadow creeping across the path here. This one in particular, going right across to there. Okay. Um, the next thing I'm going to get in is the little mountain range there, because uh, there's a little mountain peak. Now this is Capity Valley. Now, I'm not really sure what that mountain peak is, but it sits in there around right about there, drops down to there. Now if you don't know Capity Valley, um, every Australian should know Capity Valley, but it's not that well known. Um, but apparently it's the second largest, next, uh, you know, second only to the Grand Canyon in America. Um, of the particular rock formation or sandstone or whatever it is, I'm not really entirely sure. Perhaps some of you on the call will know. So we've got that distant tree there, and then we've got more of a foreground tree that's going to come just, a, just above there. So it's going to come to about there. Okay. So I'm just feeling my way through here, just trying to find where these big shapes are. And um, I think I could probably put that trunk there. Yeah, so it's um, it's not that well known in Australia, but artists in Australia have been going to Capiti Valley for 100 years or so because it's quite a dramatic place and um, I've been there a couple of times, can't wait to get back. I feel that this needs to be a bit narrower there. So I'm just getting our big shapes in 
And I really believe, having observed lots of uh, people starting out painting through the Learn to Paint Academy and also um, through workshops, I really believe that spending time focusing on getting your composition right is so important. Okay, there's another tree that's sitting in a roundabout there. Getting these shapes right is, um, to me, one of the most important components of making paintings work. Okay, and then round about there, we've got another tree that's sitting around about there. Okay, so when I take that tape off, we will push up into the sky and maybe do something interesting in the sky. But for the moment, I think we've got our hands full just with um, getting all this to work, right? <laughs> One's sitting up there, that one's sitting on that horizon line there. And I feel we're kind of on track. I do feel that that's a little bit wide, but we'll see. We'll see. So what we're going to do, we're going to pause for a moment, give you a chance to ask any questions that you may have that are burning away in the back of your mind. Um, And uh, feel free to type in any questions you have. We'll just give this a chance just to dry off a little. And then what we'll do, we'll, block, we'll go into our blocking after we've had a bit of a chat. And um, then we'll finish it off next week, theoretically. So, anybody have any questions? G'day to everybody who I haven't said good morning to yet. There's big weather pattern coming across the eastern seaboard of Australia that everyone's talking about. All right, questions, questions, jolly questions. What questions do you have? bubbling away. Where is the photo? It's posted in the members area on in the activity stream and whoever asked that you're currently in, logged into the members area so if you go to the activity stream you'll find it there. Uh, Meryl says I always thought the horizon line was where the sky meets the land but you have used the land excluding the mountains. Yeah that's probably the, the technical definition of a horizon line. I use the horizon line as wherever I can find a sort of flat um, dividing line in, in the landscape. So I'm probably using the wrong terminology. Um, so it's, yeah, you're right, it's not the horizon line. It's just a, a flat line that we can use as a reference to, um, to paint from. Um, can I paint this in acrylics? You can paint, the, the more method of painting works in traditional oils, water mixable oils, acrylics and gouache. So yes you can is the answer. Um, just follow exactly the same process. Could the mountain range be taller? Maybe, yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I think it's probably proportionally right. Um, I don't know if I want to make it too much bigger because if we have a look, it's not that big in there. Um, so just because it's, you know we've got more sky, I don't know that I'd necessarily want to grow the mountain range. But you can do whatever you want with your version. So yeah, you could could do that. Um, G'day Evelyn. Because I find my darks are always purple no matter what I do, I'm adding some burnt umber. Well, that, that's an option, yeah. But if you're too purple, it just means you don't have enough yellow in the mix. How long will it take to complete? Well, we'll probably go for about an hour today and, and maybe an hour next week on this one. It's just a little practice demo. It's not going to be a completed painting. So from the taped area up, you will fill in the sky. That's correct. Yeah, Beverly, we'll do that right at the end. Now, what I'll do, I won't bother doing that until I've got a finished painting because it might work without that extra sky, which might mean that we then take it off those stretch bars and, um, and you know, you could frame it without the extra area. So I won't 
even think about that part until we get towards the end. Uh, it's Capity Valley is the uh, range. Jenny says she thinks the mountain range is perfect. Thank you, Jenny. All right. Any questions? Thank you, Tracy. My pleasure, Pavatha, I think it is. Forgive me if I don't pronounce your name correctly. Morning, Julie. Jenny says she believes the mountain range is in proportion. Jolly good. Thank you, Jenny. All right. So far, so good then. It appears that we are on track. So, next thing's blocking, right? So we're going right back to basics today, which I like to do periodically. So looking at this, we need to identify our, we're gonna do our blocking with a values, underlying values pattern in mind, okay? So um, what I always do then is I ask myself, well, where's the darkest dark? And this is a pretty obvious one. In fact, the, the values are laid out pretty well in this. Um, the darkest dark is clearly that right-hand side tree. And then we move to the left-hand side foreground tree, then to the next row of trees a bit further back, then to the middle distance trees, then to the mountain range, right? So that's our sort of values gradation. Uh, it's going to be through there. So that's what we'll do. Sometimes what we need to do is just follow what nature presents in front of us, although photos will distort and alter things too much. But um, Whereas the valley, Capity Valley, is uh, near the Blue Mountains, actually, in New South Wales. Um, it's further west. If you keep heading west towards Mudgee, you pass the turn off to Capity Valley. All right, I'm going to use my big blocking brush. Big synthetic brush. It's a bit bigger than one inch. And um, probably better suited for large paintings. Now, somebody said before, no matter what I do, I end up with purple. Okay, so if you mix blue and red together like so, and then we take a little bit of white, then we flip that in, you can see there, you get purple. That's on the blue side. If I add more red to that, I'll get closer to a true purple, right? So if you're getting purple, it just means that you've got blue and red dominating in the mix. Okay. If you want to adjust that away from purple, you add the third primary, being the yellow. So we've got our three primaries. But if you add too much of the yellow, then you'll lighten it off. Now you can see I've added too much, and I've gone to yellowy green. Okay, so what does that mean, yellowy green? I'm trying to get a neutral dark. So if I've got a yellowy green, then you know that means I've got blue and yellow now dominating. So I add a little bit more red into it. Okay, and that will neutralize out the green. Now, if this is all confusing for you, highly recommend our color mixing course, right? So see that, that just adding that red in, okay, has moved it away from green. Now I'll just add a little bit more blue. The blue will darken it back up again, okay? You see that? So it's not, it's not a black, because we don't want black. It's just a dark. We just want our darkest dark, okay? And then temperature becomes important, right? So I've just pushed that a little bit bluer. Just cooled it down a little bit. I could just get tiny, it's a little bit of red. And there we go, that's close enough to what I want. It's the darkest dark, okay? Now I had a little bit of purple in the brush, so, because it's such a big brush. As soon as I mixed that back in, it went a bit more purple, but I'm okay with purple. Purple's great. Here we go, see that? Darkest dark, okay. So now I'm just going to have a little look here at the photo because there's, well, I could always add it back in sky holes, I suppose. Well, maybe I won't. Maybe we'll just leave, leave a little gap there for these trees to, trunks to come through. 
something like that. Okay. So use big brushes at this early stage. We don't want to muck around. Probably just block all that in with dark and then we'll shape that up next week. Pop in some shadow. See how much darker that is than my drawing mix? because I've got the yellow in there at the drawing mix is more, more purple. <coughs> so these shadows here are from a tree that's outside of the um, subject. Okay. So if I've got the shape right, roughly, it's, maybe it's just feeling a little bit wide, but I'll live with it, right? So now I'm going to come back to this tree here, and it's back a little bit in distance. So there's a, there is a definite step back in value to this one, and then to that one, then to here. These two are probably on the same, and then a few little shrubs out there, right? So the question we're going to ask is, how do we represent this values-wise? First thing we need to do is we know that our darkest darks are usually come forward, and our lighter tones recede. So I'll get a little tiny bit of white. I'll mix that in. Okay, so it'll start to lighten it off. But then the other thing we need to know about, about it is temperature. That as we go back, we will just cool it ever so slightly. A little touch more of the, um, the blue in there, right? Now we'll need to clean this brush because it holds a ton of paint. And there'd be no point in me mixing up a new value, but then having the previous one from the brush dominate. <laughs> hope that makes sense. So we should see, it's going to be difficult to sort of reference them, but if I was to put a, a touch there, it's very subtle, but there's definitely a difference there. Okay. Just blocking it in. So it's going to look, at this early stage, it's going to look somewhat blocky. <laughs> Surprisingly, and that can be a little bit unsettling for people. Um, pop in a couple of tree trunks and things in there. Actually, you see how I've got this tree here and then this background one. I've got them almost the same width and it's probably not a good thing. I probably need to decide do I want this one to be slightly more dominant than that one. And therefore, if, it, if I do, I'll only show a glimpse of the one at the back. So that'll, I think that might make just a uh, you know, more interesting composition. If I just make this foreground one just a little bit more dominant there, and we'll just sneak the other one in behind it. I hope that makes sense. So I'll get more white, a little bit more of the blue. Don't want to get too light and too blue just yet because we've got that mountain range there, right? Which is our bluey gray value. So I've got to I've got to work up to that. So this should look like a, a change in the values back to this back section here, which it does. that fairly thin. Okay. So I don't know whether that's translating on the video or not, but um, that tree looks like to me it's behind this one, which is what we want. And what I could do, I mean, there's lots of different ways to separate them. Um, we could use highlights to create a bit of separation between them. But what I could do is just mix a slightly darker value just for around this edge here, just push that a little bit more. And I've got very loose paint there, so we're looking for that to dry. Okay, come back into here. Have a 
mixed up enough paint, have I? Now, does that tree have any other? Yeah, it's roughly that sort of shape. We'll shape it up as we go. Couple more in there. Little tree there. And then we've got this tree sitting up there on that hillside there. Any more than that, it's going to start to become too cluttered. As it is, I feel that I haven't got the sort of same vastness, and I think that's because I made this tree too big and these two, well, maybe not these, but this one, doesn't quite have that expansive feel. Um, and I've got that mountain running uphill. It should be running across there. So we'll fix that. Um, so yeah, any more trees and things in the middle there is going to just make it all too cluttered feeling. So the background mountain is a bluey grey. So that tells us pretty much all we need to know. It's a blue with a grey. Grayed off, right? Don't make it too dark. How do I grey off a blue? Well, yeah, the other two primaries. Or the complement. The complement of blue on the colour wheel is the orange. So I could add orange in there if I had orange on my palette, which I don't, right? Um, but I do have what makes up an orange, red and yellow. So to grey back or mute a primary colour, you add a little bit of the other two primary colours into it. So to get my blue a blue-grey, that's what I need to do. Right? But it's just getting that right tone um, for it and the right value, that's going to be the key. When I put it up there, I'll do a little test and what I want to do is just make sure that it feels like the mountain sitting way off in the background. Okay. That's our real goal here with this mix. So you want to take your time with that mix and you want to come up and compare it to our darkest dark. How's that looking? It's looking a little bit not quite right. Okay, I'm going to make it bluer. Now if you, if you saw the master's analysis I did yesterday of William Went, you can see that he, um, he really controlled or created a feeling of depth through temperature to his background mountains. Um, and did it very nicely too. Okay, so that mountain's going to run through here. Okay, so I'll just get this mountain in, then we'll pause again for a little bit of Q&A, and then we'll come in and we'll do the field after that. We won't worry about the sky today. I'll leave the sky as a tool I can use later to reshape things. So you can see when I put it against this tree here, it definitely looks like that mountain's back behind it. And that's what we really want, create that feeling of depth. The, the master's uh, analysis is posted in the course for the master's analysis. You need to be a full access member to access it. Um, so it's posted under courses, master's analysis course, where all the others are. And in the group, I post up the photo library for William Wentz photos. Okay. So I just want to be mindful of not letting this mountain range grow, so I'm just going to make it lower there. See, that's quite thin, that paint. There's a fair bit of water in there. Now, I've got a feeling that's a little bit too dark, <laughs> but it's against white. So this, this is one of the tricks we're painting, right? Is that I've only got it against white and dark at the moment. So, you know, what's my eye comparing it to? Because all colour is relative. 
whether the color looks right or not, it's relative to what it's next to generally. Okay. So at the moment it's looking a little bit dark. When I start to put in some warmer tones and so on, it may look just right, just what it's meant to look like. It may not. So it's something we have to just consider and maybe can you know look at adjusting later on. Okay. So our next step will be to do a, a warmish underpainting for the fields. Um, which we'll do in just a moment. But first, we shall pause and um, have a discussion with the Brains Trust. Okay. What size canvas am I using? It's a 16 inch by 20 inch, which I have taped off um, to make it more in line with how the photo looks, which is more of a panoramic. Um, so that's why I've taped it off. Um, 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 um. Serena says she always loves my trees. Thank you, Serena. Appreciate that. <laughs> G'day, Pauline. Gary says, I know it's only a blocking, but the mountain looks a bit pointy. It is a bit. I, I thought the same thing. I'm going to round it off when I paint the sky in. Um, so I'll adjust the shape of it when I paint the sky. And the thing when I'm when you're blocking your darks, you always want to go a little bit bigger than what you you think you're going to need them. Because it's easier to put opaque paint over your transparent darks than than to try and make your darks bigger when you've got opaque paint there. So um, I always overpaint my darks and then trim them up when I come in with the lighter tones over the top. So yeah, I agree. I was thinking that when I did it, it, it is. The shape of it's not quite right. And um, we'll adjust it when we paint the sky around it. So. To narrow the tree on the right, would you wipe it off or is it better to change it in step two? Um, well, this tree on the right, if I if I thought to myself, no, nah, that's just not going to work, I would... Um, I would just wipe it back at this stage because it's still wet, although it's drying, right? So it's still wet a bit. Um, so yeah, wipe it back if you can. I think that's a, um, always your best bet. G'day, Ron. Thank you, mate. Um, this is a painting we've done previously in the Learn to Paint TV, but as I explained at the very start, I used the wrong portion canvas and, um, and I got all my shapes out of control. So that's why I'm coming back to it now number of years later, just to uh, see if we can get it right this time, right? <laughs> okay, so does anybody have any questions while we pause? Good to know, Lynn. Glad to hear he's on the mend. <coughs> uh, how important is it to keep brush strokes in the same direction, says W. Lynn. Well, I don't know that you do want to keep them in the same direction. You couldn't have a whole painting with brush marks in the same direction. Um, I think you want to use the direction of your brush marks to indicate form. So if you want to paint a field that has a, sl you know, a slope, then you want your brush marks to be indicating that form. Um, but that might be that way for the field, but it might be a different direction for um, the trees or your, your clouds, right? So you don't want all the same direction, but you want to use your brush marks to create form. Um, Thank you, Foxy. Yes, we discussed that one. All right, anybody have any questions? Questions, questions, questions. Now, part of the reason why we pause at this particular point in time to do questions is just to let that paint just start to dry off a little bit. Okay, it'll just make my job easier when we come and block in the field. Um, but you can see there, like, I'm just looking in the, in the monitor in reverse, that already there's a feeling of depth developing in this painting. Okay, and that's a, it may be subtle at the moment, but that's okay. Um, what, what's the best dimensions for a canvas board to do a panoramic painting? Oh, depends on the subject area. I don't know that there is a best one, but there is a ratio though, which is one to one and a half. So for every 
one inch high, you want to, you know, for good landscape painting, you want to go one and a half inches wide, right? So if you're 10 inches high, you want to be 15 inches wide, if you can, right? or thereabouts. Um, and I've found that to be a good landscape ratio, um, one to 1.5. However, um, this is probably more one to 1 1.8. I would say. I've put my tape, if you look at the photo reference, right, I've actually put my tape higher than where it should be. The tape pr probably should be around about there if I'm, um, if I'm directly copying the photo. But you don't always want to directly copy your photo, right? Um, Pauline says, I like the composition. I like paths. Yeah, me too. I like things that lead you into a painting. Barbara says, a definite feeling of depth. Yeah, if you, for, as a general rule of thumb with landscape painting, one to one and a half seems to work really well uh, for landscapes. But there are going to be times like you know, where you've got more of a panoramic, which is down to one to two, for instance. All right, my computer's frozen. Okie doke, how would you age a bridge? How would you age a bridge? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Do you mean paint an old bridge? Well, a bridge would just be a shape with edges and three values and, and the right color, colors that are required. Um, but I'm not entirely sure that that's what your question is there, Lynn. All right, let's get back into it. Um, let us get back into painting and we are now going to do do panoramic um, I don't tend to do a lot of panoramics um, to be honest um, mostly because it's difficult to buy pre-made stuff I've got some boards that I've got cut up that could be used as panoramic okay so we're gonna this is all going to be grass fields in here right um, and then there's another sort of like hill to another field at the back. And we want to do an underpainting, but it wouldn't make sense for us to do a green underpainting. Um, so greens and yellows, we'll, we'll put in the complement, and we'll grey it back a bit, and the complement of green on the colour wheel is... Dun, 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 dun. Complement of green on the colour wheel is... Well, you have a think about it. I'll mix up some paint, all right? Um, and uh, see what you think. However, I don't generally um, do the direct complement. I always add a little bit of yellow into it and I'll add a little bit of blue into it to grey it. And the reason why I sort of push it a little bit more on the orange side is because in Australia we have this red earthy feel and it makes a good underpainting. Now, if you're in Wales, that may not be the case, so you may want to just use more of a, a red. But see how I've pushed that to more of a slightly orangey tone. And then I'll scrape up some of this bluey grey, and I'll add that in, so just so it's not too vibrant. And I've got some white there, so I can start to lighten it back. Okay, so there's my little puddle of paint. And this will go nicely. You won't see much of it, but it'll go nicely under the greens. Um, so... It should work well. All right. So. Da -da -da -da. Orange? Yeah, no, it's really red. The, the uh, complement to... Complement to green is red, but I push it orange. Yeah. The more earthy sort of tone. That probably could go a little bit more yellow in there. And I can get a touch more blue. There we go. Okay. Now, I want this paint to be fairly thin. It'll be dry by next week when we come back to tackle this again. Um, I don't want it to be too strong, so add a little touch of white. Okay. But if you're going to paint this in one session, then you, know, you, you don't want this to be wet, thick paint, especially if you're an oil painter or water mixable oils. Acrylics will dry. You go down a cup of tea, right? Um, but for those of us painting in oils and so on... Um, thin the paint right down at this point, okay? That could even be touch lighter. 
and it's a gradient. So we start with our darker version of this paint and we work backwards to a light version. Uh, it's a gradient. Okay. So if you keep that in mind, then that'll give you a feeling of depth developing in there. Sorry, I've got my phone on for a very particular reason. So I hope that's not annoying, but I'm just waiting on a message, so. Uh, all right, a bit more water, a little bit more light, so I'll lighten it back. And when we start to just pop it in there like so. Working around there. If I lose some of those tree trunks at this stage, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Shall I come back again? Tell me, dear, are you lonesome tonight? Boom, 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 boom. Does your memory fade in the bright summer day when I kiss you? Okay, as you can probably tell, I was brought up listening to Elvis. That was a very bad impersonation, but I wanted to make sure you got your money's worth today. <laughs> okay. Don't worry if you've got a harsh transition, we'll just soften that out like so. Up to that hill there. Shadow, a little bit of tree trunk. Okay, and um, like this subject was one of those ones that I didn't have to really think about composition. It was just laid out in front of me. And that's the beauty of a place like Capity Belly is that everywhere you look, there's a subject that's just ready made, ready to go. Um, so God's done all the work in that regard. Our job is just to capture it. Uh, now, uh, to this little hill at the background, I'll just um, lighten that off and I'll get a little bit more blue in to cool it down and really gray it off, right? See how gray that went when I put the blue in? Okay, just to make sure that we've got a definite difference there. Okay. Good to drop a couple little sky holes in there early, early on. Beautiful. Now this path's looking a little bit too, uh, uh, a little bit too regimented, um, but we'll fix that up. We'll pull some grass over it and stuff um, later on. But what I will do is we'll just mix up a more of a yellowy tone. It looks fairly yellow-ish there. Okay, and again, it needs, you know, wants to be a gradient. So we want to be a little bit darker down in here. Blur up those edges along the shadow. that you want to blur that up as well and then I'll just add a little bit more lighter tone into that lighten the very back with some white okay now how high up is that going to go I think that's going to run right up to there isn't it I'm not sure what that shadow tone was meant to be for Be 
to go a bit lighter than that at the end there. And I could probably just get a slightly darker value down in here. All right. Now, there's not a lot that we've done here today that you could legitimately go, well, Rod, you're a bloody genius. Pardon my French. Um, and I could never do that because everything I've shown you, you could do, right? It's just a matter of thinking it through. Start with your composition, get your shapes right, work your values systematically backwards, and then this is a gradient of... Uh, orange and so on. Um, anyone could do that. Helps to get the knowledge you need first. Ah, oh, I thought that was a delivery for me then, not to worry. All right, that brings us pretty much to the end of step two of the more method of painting. Why aren't I doing the sky? Because I'm gonna use a sky to reshape my trees and mountain range uh, next week. So that's why we're leaving the sky for now. So that brings us to question time. Hope the message is good news. I'm getting a fence re rebuilt um, at home. It was falling apart. So um, it's to do with a fence. <laughs> well, I'm pretty excited about getting a new fence. Tell you what, the trouble to try and get somebody to come and build a fence. Goodness me. Uh, what is the focal point? I don't know that there is an actual focal point in this. I think it's really just the lead in up the pathway. Um, you know, maybe up into this mountain range up here. I don't know that there is a focal point. And I don't think every painting needs to have a focal point. Um, so... The pathway is not quite in the centre. It's, it is offset off the centre. But I understand what you're saying, Susan. But does it need to have a focal point? Or could it just be a pleasant scene? I don't, don't think every painting needs a focal point. Serena likes my singing, that's good. That's one fan for my new career. <laughs> Bev says the process really works. Big kudos, thank you, Bev. Thank you. Lynn says, yes, I'd like to hear that. I'd like to hear what? Um, me singing more? Well, stick around, Lynn. <laughs> Meryl says, one day it would be good to bring out your guitar. I sold all my guitars, Meryl, but I do want to get another one one day. One day. Um, I sold them all when I was a broke, struggling artist. About 10 years ago. Um, Lynn says, I sound really happy. Well, you know, happy enough. <laughs> Colin said, having fun painting a similar scene uh, west of Mount Wilson, all by memory of years ago, I've seen when returning by train to Bathurst. Oh, fantastic, Colin. Look forward to seeing that. Mount Wilson, beautiful. You've got plenty of subjects up um, up in the Southern Highlands there too, not far from you. <coughs> uh, Diane says, getting a fence built fixed impossible after the storms from experience. Yeah, but even without storms, it's been difficult on the Sunshine Coast anyway. Um, just finding, just getting somebody to come and quote <laughs> was challenging. So, I mean, it's been a three month wait from the time I said, yep, go ahead. Um, I guess I just can't get good staff. Uh, looking good as is, says Serena. Diana says, interested in how the green grass is going to emerge. Well, this will all dry off, right? So this is an important point, is that um, you've got to make sure that this is dry before we put the green over it. And we'll just paint the green over it and little bits of this red undertone will come through. So we're not going to see a lot of it. We might leave a little patch of earth, uh, but it'll just be enough to make the green sort of be a bit more interesting because greens can be hard. Gary said, the little voice in my head, paint effects, not objects is growing. Yeah. Um, well, you know, effects, yes, but the way I think of it is paint shapes with the right edges and the right shape in the right place with three values and the right use of colour. Colour could be hue, could be temperature, could be saturation. Really that's all there is to painting, right? Getting the shape right with the right edges around the outside um, and there could be edges within the mass as well. 
um, the values, three values, and if you see the master's analysis from yesterday, you know, often William Went would use two values for his trees, right? But let's say three values to get form and um, color, the hue, getting the right hue. Is it muted or is it saturated? And what's the temperature, right? If you think about everything you want to paint in a landscape or even a portrait, painting a nose, it's a shape with the right edges, with the right values, the right color, use of color, you can't go wrong. But if you think I've got to learn how to paint a tree because a tree has a particular way of doing it, then I think you're off track with that thinking, right? And, and that can lead you into, a, into years of despair. Gladys said, I'm relieved to know I don't always need a focal point. No, I mean, I don't think, somebody wrote on one of my YouTube videos, I'd used, um, green in the sky and uh, this person left a, a little comment there which I thought was quite amusing um, the comment was you know you, you, you're not supposed to use green in the sky it's the biggest no-no in the book and even worse you've used lemon yellow right I laughed because the painting that he was referring to um, somebody bought it years ago and um, they bought two or three of my paintings um, and they love it right so I'm, I'm thinking to myself where's this book <laughs> who's got the book <laughs> the book of all wisdom. You know, there is no right way. So you don't need a focal point. You can have a focal point if you want, but you don't need one. There is no absolutes with painting. And that's the beauty of it, I think. Uh, Serena says you need to play us a song one day. Maybe, 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 maybe not. Diana says, well, same in Victoria. I think it's, yeah, it's probably right across the board at the moment. I think people have been sitting at home on JobKeeper for too long, possibly. Oh, that's controversial. I'll take that back. In case Facebook bans me. <laughs> Rosalie says, I think I also did this one a couple of years ago. It will be fun to try again. Yeah, we, this was part of Learn to Paint TV from a couple of years ago, <coughs> this subject. And um, I wasn't happy with my version. And I knew at the time there was something wrong. I just couldn't see it. Sometimes you get too close to what you're doing. Uh, my mum. No focal point is necessary in this one. A painting like this makes one use the imagination. Always wonder what lies beyond. Yeah, very true, Brenda. I agree. Um, Robert says, I know this is a question for the coffee chat, but I'm working on a painting in a class tomorrow. Can you please tell me what colour of roofs are painted? Uh, well, I'd say there's a whole range of different colours. Um, if you're talking about like a, a farm shed in Australia, it might have corrugated iron, which would be a, a light blue grey. If you're talking about a roof in a Tuscan villa, um, oh, wouldn't you love to be in a Tuscan villa right now? Um, it's going to be more of a terracotta, so an earthy, orangey red tone. Um, so it really depends on, you know, if you're talking about a roof in parts of the UK where you might have a thatched cottage, it's going to be more of a brownie dark. Um, so I think it depends, Robert, on are you using a photo reference or are you using imagination? If you're using imagination, it could be any colour. Um, same on the Gold Coast, says Lynn, for finding a fencer. Uh, w Lynn says, what to do with the extra paint on the palette? Um, well, over time you get good at squeezing out enough paint to know that you're going to use most of it. Um, so I tend just to scrape it off. There are people who paint with acrylics who want to save it. So there's different devices for stay wet palettes and so on. Um, if you're painting with oil paints, they will stay wet for, you know, three days, four days. They'll film, form a skin over them, but you break that, you can get to the wet paint underneath. Um, so there's a few different options there, W. Lynn. Um, if you paint a lot and you're painting with oils, then they'll be wet each day and you just keep going. Uh, Meryl says, have you ever seen a hailstorm coming? The sky goes green. Yeah, I have seen this green sky one time. Yeah, down at Phillip Island. Uh, Bev says, would you recommend repainting a scene again if unhappy or leave it and do something else. Um, I, if you've finished a painting and you're unhappy with it, um, do you try and correct the mistakes? Yes, if they're not fundamental composition mistakes, right? Might be a values issue and you might want to push something further away and make something darker, bring it forward. Um, so yeah, you could correct that. But if you've got a fundamental issue, like when I did this, my version of this, I didn't have the tape there. And so everything grew up, right? And so fundamentally the composition was just wrong. So is there any point in me trying to resurrect that from the dead? No, not, not worth it, right? So that's a, one we bin to burner. 
um, and and have another go at it. Repaint the same thing. You know, do a new painting of the same thing. That's perfectly fine. I've done lots and lots of like that 1770 painting. I've painted five times in the last 18 months. Um, and Sue and I are heading up there again in uh, late November for a week. So um, I'll probably have a fresh spurt of painting 1770. <laughs> We're having a little holiday. Good on you, Winnie. Um, Susan said, gives us permission to be looser with our paint. Yeah, absolutely, Susan. Loosen up, have fun, just splash paint around and please yourself first and foremost. That's the most important thing. There's no rules with art. You know, anybody who tries to tell you you've done it wrong, then just don't listen to those people, right? Now, there are fundamental principles that will make your paintings work better and be more pleasing, which is what we teach, uh, you know, firstly with the more method of painting and then progressing to the fundamentals. You know, it's important to know those. And you can always see this in abstract artists. You, you look at a, uh, there are some abstract art that just doesn't work and it's terrible. And there's some abstract art which commands your attention and draws you in and just has an, an emotive appeal and an evocative nature to it, right? But what's the difference? Well, you know, studying it, I, usually the very good abstract artists have a solid grounding in fundamental painting uh, principles, right? And, and it may not immediately be obvious in an abstract, but it's underlying, underpinning the strength of that piece. My pleasure, Tina. Thank you for joining us in Alabama. Sweet home, Alabama. Uh, Wendy says, thank you so much for all the great information and wonderful delivery. My pleasure, Wendy. Thank you for joining us. Mitch says, I can't find the master's analysis on the website, only August. Uh, well, if you go into the master's analysis course, you have to scroll through the pages to the end. Um, and they're not, they're not put into dates, they're put into numbers. So it's number nine, um, Mitch. Um, August might be the uh, critiques you might be looking at. Um, so you need to go into the group master's analysis and, sorry, into the course for master's analysis and then scroll through to you find number nine, William Went. You'll find it there. Uh, how do you spell the location? Kappa T, so it's C-A-P-E-R-T-E-E, -E -E, I believe. Kappa T Valley. Beautiful spot. Can't wait to get back there one day. Oh, last time I was there, it was stormy and raining, and um, I slept in the car a few nights because it was too wet to set the tent up, which was, wasn't great. And then the next day, the clouds cleared, and I found a camping spot, um, which was fairly full. And I uh, found one patch of grass, a little camping spot, and I jumped out of the car with my tent ready to set up, and this great big red-bellied black snake slithered up over the <laughs> ridge and just decided he was going to sit right where I was going to put my tent. So I slept in the car that night as well. <laughs> Fun games of outdoor painting, eh? Colin said, thanks so much, Rod, for your more method. Works well for all of us. Who knows? We could have choir practice while we paint. Music is such a fantastic adjunct to painting and creativity. Absolutely, Colin. In fact, you, I've always been surprised over the last decade how many people who are good painters have been musicians um, previously, and a lot of them guitarists. So that's interesting. Hey Gail, my pleasure W Lynn, 572. Sajada says, thank you Rod, couldn't paint for a while but can't wait to get back, you inspire me. Good on you Sajada. Lynn said, Rod, Russian painting my bridge is too, too bright which makes it look too new. Uh, yeah, well then you need to grab it back. It means when you say too bright, what you're really talking about is the saturation is too strong. So it needs to be grayed back, okay? Um, but exactly how to do that, we'd, we'd have to see it to be able to, to understand. Um, Foxy says, thanks Rod, I look forward to seeing the finished painting. This one, yeah, finished. Uh, thanks Carleen. Tanya says, I'm a saxophonist, can't sing for nuts though. Well, you must have good lungs though, Tanya, to play the sax. Thanks Jenny. Bev said, just began this week with your program. Will there be any landscapes with snow for learning? Uh, Bev, in our paint, <coughs> the Impressionists, we did a couple of snow scenes. I don't have any snow around me. I live in the subtropics, so it's difficult for me to get reference material, but we have done a couple. 
um, I think it was about three in the uh, Paint with the Impressionist program. Um, but you know, maybe after we finish this one, I'll see if I can source a snow painting to do. Um, snow is just greys, different greys. Jenny says, hi Rod and everyone, a bit late today, just squeezing in a walk around Lake Jindabyne before the rain. Very nice, Jenny. Hope you got some photos. Good on you, Lynn. Uh, where are we? Yeah, courses is the place to go. Uh, and then go into the group for Masters Analysis and you'll find the photo library there. Wendy said, had you ever thought of doing some landscapes from the Canadian West Coast? I'd love to, Wendy. Um, in fact, in the Paint with the Impressionist, we are going to do one or two. I'll be doing those in coming month. Uh, but I don't have any photo reference material of the Canadian West Coast. So um, if somebody has some that they're happy for me to use for commercial purposes, then uh, you can send it through to our support desk and we'll have a look. Um, it's difficult though because what you, what, you know, what somebody takes a photo of and thinks might be a good reference to paint doesn't necessarily translate into a good teaching subject. So I have to be selective to make sure that everyone benefits from it, not just the uh, person who wants that painting uh, painted, if that makes sense. Uh, Rosalie said, I watched a YouTube artist who was heckled by a passerby telling him he was wasting his time. Laugh out loud, he was one of the artists in my inspiration book. Yeah, well, people suck, basically. <laughs> There's enough of them out there that are just horrible human beings that they're, the only possible thing to do is to delete them and ignore them. <laughs> now, when I say people suck, I don't mean broadly. I'm talking about a small percentage of people. Of course, you guys are all awesome. And um, fill me full of joy. So thank you for being here. Gary says, off topic, but just saw this on the news. A replica of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa has been sold off to a European collector for 3.4 million, 10 times far out. 3.4 million for a copy. There we go, friends. How about we, we have a go at copying a Mona Lisa one time? <laughs> Susan says, my art was dancing. Now my paintbrush is dancing. Well, you could put a bit of uh, a bit of dancing into your actual painting process as well. That could become your thing, you know, the dancing painter with the dancing paintbrush. I can see a whole angle around that, Susan. It came up good on video. You depends on what type of dancing, of course. Have to be mindful of that. But I said thanks, Rod. Love snow paintings. Now just finished six of them. Good on you, Valerie. Where'd you get the reference material from? Thanks, Wendy. Gary said, out of interest, who was the artist? Uh, okay, that's the one who was heckled. Um, would love to see you paint some beautiful South African scenes. Again, I don't have reference material. So if you've got some, send them through to our support desk. Tell us the details. But only send us photos that you personally took, right? And um, not one you found on the web. And uh, you have to have personally taken it. And you have to be happy for... Uh, to be used for commercial purposes. And what I mean by that is obviously it's going to be uh, part of what we do at the Learn to Paint Academy if we use it, but also our students have the rights to copy and sell any of the photos we use in the Learn to Paint Academy. So you have to be okay with that. Um, but don't give me one off the internet that you found, right? Because that's just not going to work for us for copyright reasons. Um, thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Jenny. Julie says, looking forward to trying this one. Good on you, Jenny. Uh, Julie, looks great. Looks great for the ugly stage. It's going good. Thanks, Linda. Enjoy your wee getaway. Oh, that's not until the end of November. A couple of weeks' time. I'll um, have a little holiday. Pauline says, what do you look? What do you look? What do you look in a photo that you consider a good teaching subject? Um, something that's simple, Pauline. With with half a dozen big shapes, right? If there's Lots of scattered little bits of information all over the place that can't be clumped into big shapes, and it's not going to be a very good teaching um, teaching subject. Pauline says, I belong to a Facebook group called... Yeah, I'm not going to use any of those, Pauline. Um, I, I'm, I'm also members of different groups like that, but there's no way, because I run a business, you know, that um, that I'm going to use those. I, I, uh, but, yeah that they're a good spot for you to go and source reference material, but I'm just not going to use them in the Learn to Paint Academy. Um, Susan says, my fascination factor? It could be. It could be, especially if you've got a dancing outfit or something. Um, and you, you, know, you sway up to the canvas. and I, I can see a whole, a whole brand built around that as an artist. 
Lisa says, nice to be back. Love your teaching. Good on you, Lisa. Good to have you back. It's been a while since we've seen you here. Woody Weber. Don't know him. Thanks, Serena. All right, we're going to wrap up, friends. Um, you are making me nervous. Envious, says Bev. Mm, not sure why, Bev. Not sure why, but... Um, Snow is a lot of greys, absolutely. It's well, it's it's a mixture of cool and warm greys I've found from the ones that I've done. Um, but yeah, it's just greys. It's not white. Um, uh, yeah, don't eat yellow snow. <laughs> um, Well, Robert, um, send it through to our support desk. If you've taken the photo, send it through to our support desk and we'll have a look at it and we'll let you know whether um, it's a good teaching subject for us or not. Oh, subtropics? Yeah, it's, I, I love the subtropics. It does get a little bit hot and sweaty. Um, Molly the cat is starting to feel it and so am I. So I need to get back in shape, lose some weight. Um, Helen says, are you interested in a lake with cypress trees to paint? Yeah, as long as it's not a Bob Rossi type scene. Um, I think Bob Ross's organisation does that type of painting well, but if it's one you've taken, then send it through and we'll have a look, absolutely. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Mary. Uh, yeah, send it through to our support desk. Learn to paint Academy forward slash support. Open a support ticket. You can add your photo there and we'll have a look. Thanks, Gary. Um, we'll have snow in Scotland soon, so I'll get my camera out and send out some. Yeah, and try and get like a little, um, you know, little farmhouse or something, you know, that we can uh, use, not just snow. Um, so happy to happy to have a look at that, especially as we head into a hot summer here. Cheers, Rosalie. Um, all right, friends, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for joining me. We'll let this one dry off. I think it's, we're on the right track. Definitely some good things happening in it and um, can't wait to see it finished. So make sure you join me uh, next week. Now tomorrow we have got our advanced live stream. We're going to get back to that big painting we're doing of the uh, Tully River. So you'll need to be a full access member and you'll log in via the members site and the live section. Um, so hopefully I'll see you there. And then on Friday we've got our coffee chat. Your chance to ask any questions about painting, being an artist, the business of 